Now, this morning, as we move into the passage that was just read for you, we need to start by me giving you a little bit of context, a little bit of reminder of what those of you who are here over last weekend heard at each campus, and then a little more backstory so you understand all that's going on. You remember, we've said many times that Daniel and his three friends have been brought into Babylon, and while they are there, the story that you heard last week preached to you reminded you that they decided that in a very personal way, they needed to hang on to that which was for them part of the deep fabric of their faith. And so in a very personal way, they said, you know what, we're not going to eat the food that the king is having everybody else eat. We're going to stay true to the dietary restrictions of what is within our Jewish law. Now, the way they did this was very clandestine. It was very private. And uh, what they did was they first went to the guy who was in charge of all of them and said, hey, what we want to do is you can feed that stuff to everybody else, but not to us. Well, that scared that guy because he knew literally he could lose his head if he didn't do his job and make sure that all of the, his charges stayed healthy. And so he said, well, I'm not so sure about this. And they said, I tell you what, if we can figure it out, he says, if you can work it out with your guard, then you can do it. And so very quietly, if you remember the story, they basically went to their guard and said, look, you're going to bring us the tray with all the food, but we're only going to eat the things that fall inside of our dietary restrictions. So, you know, throw a few more vegetables on the tray because that's the kind of thing that we are going to eat. And if you know the story, what happened is after the testing time, after 10 days, these guys, these four who were eating just the vegetables and weren't eating all the fine foods that everybody else was, they looked stronger and more well-nourished than any of the others. On top of that, God blessed their obedience. So much so that Scripture says God poured out special wisdom and special understanding and special capacity on these four guys so that at the end of the training time, when they came before the king, the king said, you know what? There is no one equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These guys are the finest. They're the best out of the entire class of recruits. And so what happened next is incredible. The king gave them positions of actual provincial leaders. They actually became, if, if you will, kind of the head of entire counties there in Babylon. This is eye-popping. This is an amazing level of promotion and trust given to a foreigner, and believe me, I'm sure it wasn't received well by all the local Babylonian guys. And I've got to imagine that every morning, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if we'll go with the name that they are used, their Babylonian name in this story, woke up and pinched themselves and said, can you believe that we got this job and have this level of opportunity as strangers in this land? And it happened as a result of the fact that they acted with integrity in this personal way. But the next test that's coming their way now is a very public one. One morning they wake up. They're walking out into that Middle Eastern sun. They're, they're heading to their duties and responsibilities. And they see set up in the distant plain. They see scaffolding going up. And they see all kinds of workers and slaves going out there. And so they run over to the foreman and they say, what's going on here? And he says, well, we are beginning to prepare a statue, and it's going to be magnificent, but it's an engineering nightmare because it's nine feet wide, but it's 90 feet tall, and it's covered completely in gold. And the king has ordered that it be built and that when it is constructed, everybody is going to have to bow down in front of it. And I'm telling you that as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked away that day, they shook their heads in disbelief at the irony of all that was going on. First, let me address something very quickly and set it aside because some people read this and they're like, this is the book of Daniel. Where's Daniel? And some people are like, did Daniel end up bowing down? Can I tell you something right now? Watch the whole nature and character of Daniel from beginning to end of the book. He's not afraid of lions. He's not afraid of anything. Daniel didn't bow down. Daniel was a man who had many responsibilities. And so either Daniel simply is not around when this takes place or he's ill when this takes place. He's simply not a part of this particular story. 
But these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not miss the irony of all of it. And for me to explain that to you, let me give you the rest of the backstory. Daniel chapter 2, you should go home and, and read it today. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a terrifying dream. He dreams that he sees a statue in front of him. The head is made of gold. The arms and chest are made of silver. The body is made of iron, and the feet are made of iron mixed with clay. And as he is watching this magnificent statue, suddenly a huge rock is cut out the side of this mountain, and it comes down, and it smashes the statue into a million pieces, and the rock is set up in its magnificence where the statue once was. When Nebuchadnezzar wakes up, he knows he has dreamed something significant. But he doesn't know what it means. He's terrified by this dream. So you know what he does? He calls in all of his Babylonian enchanters and magicians and sorcerers and, and, you know, palm readers. And he says, all right, guys, I need your help. I've had this dream. I need to know what it means. And they say, you've called on the right guys. We, we're in touch. Go ahead and tell us the dream, and we'll tell you what it means. But Nebuchadnezzar says, nope, we're not playing it this way this time. Here's how it's going down this time. If you really do have any kind of power of the gods in you, then I want you to tell me what I dreamed and then tell me the interpretation of the dream. All the Babylonian guys go, you can't ask that of us. No king anywhere has ever asked that of his wise men. So just tell us the dream and we'll interpret. He says, no, 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 enough talk. If you can't do this for me, tell me what I dreamed, then I want all of you taken away out of my sight. And in fact, he turns to Arioch, his leader. He says, I want you to get every wise man we've got in the entire land and kill them all. Daniel chapter 2. Kill them all. Well, this includes Daniel and, and, and the other three. And so they are taken, and as they're on their way to be killed, Daniel says to Arioch, he says, would you just give us a couple days? Give us a couple days. And so Arioch says, okay, I will do that. And so Daniel and those other three, they go before God, and they fast, and they pray earnestly. Wouldn't you? And they say, God, you brought us here, but we're done if you don't give us this information. And so in a dream, God reveals to Daniel what Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed. So Daniel goes to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, you need to know, there is no man who is wise enough to do what you have asked to be done. However, you need to know that there is a God in heaven who is the revealer of secrets and who is the greatest one over all. And he is the one who has revealed to me the meaning of the dream. And then Daniel says this, in your dream, you saw a great statue. And Daniel described that statue to him. And he said to him, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. You're the greatest leader of all of these kingdoms. But multiple kingdoms are represented here. But then, King Nebuchadnezzar, you saw that stone come down and smash that statue. And you need to understand, King, the meaning of that stone is this. There is one who's greater than you. There is one who's greater than any kingdom, anytime, anywhere. And there is one whose kingdom will come and it will be established forever and ever and ever because he is the everlasting God. That's what your dream means, King Nebuchadnezzar. And I want you to see, we're going to put the scripture on the screen from you, from the end of Daniel chapter 2, this was Nebuchadnezzar's response. Read this with me with emphasis. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Folks, do you see what happens here? As a result of this, Nebuchadnezzar, at some point in his life, came to a recognition that there was a God over all. And that's why I tell you, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out a few months, a few years, maybe even a couple decades later, at some point, Nebuchadnezzar has forgotten that there is one who is the greatest, and he is Jehovah God, because he is now setting up this idol, this great big huge statue. Now, do you see the irony here? What was the entire statue covered in? What? Gold, right? Do you remember which part of the statue I told you Nebuchadnezzar was? The head. And what was the head made of? What's Nebuchadnezzar saying? I'm the real deal. I'm the whole thing. 
Let me show you how great I am. Didn't even say it in the reading we read, what God can rescue you from me? And so those guys see this, and they clearly say to themselves, oh, we understand exactly what's going on here. Now, don't miss this. If earlier in their lives they were willing to say in this personal test, we will obey what has been our historic following of our faith by how we eat, how much greater is the pressure now? Because they know that when that image is completed, they have to bow down before it. And you see, the second commandment, the second commandment for the Jewish people, and for us, by the way, is you will make no idol, and you will not bow down or worship in front of an idol. And now, a very public test is coming to them. What are we going to do? I don't know if they had to churn on it for weeks or for months. Maybe it took a year to build it. I don't know. But it was coming, and these guys had to say, are we going to compromise our faith? Are we going to have the courage to refuse to bow? I want us to talk this morning about this idea of what does it take to really have the kind of courage to draw the line in our lives. The kind of courage to say, you know what? It doesn't matter what the rest of the world does. I'm drawing a line in the sand right here and saying, I'm a servant of the Most High God, and I can't live that way. Does anybody here today think sometimes it's going to require that kind of courage to live in this day and age? That we'll say, I'm drawing a line. I can't live the way the rest of the world is living. You see, here's the thing. When it comes to compromise, we always want to tell ourselves it's no big deal. We always want to say, you know, why should we have to be different? Why should we always have to be the ones that stand out or or stick out? Why should we always have to differ from the way the world around us is living? And let me tell you what the answer to that question is. We end up different because we march to the beat of a different drummer. Because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us who brings conviction and guidance and direction to our life and says, this is the way you should go. And it doesn't matter if every other magazine out there says something different or if every other opinion out there on the talk show says something different. You march to the beat of a different drummer. And so suddenly we are required to have courage to fight the temptation to compromise and to simply give in. Because we mistakenly think to ourselves, you know what, if I just compromise, I can take all the pressure off. We think, you know what, if I just kind of go along, then once I get through this compromise, then, then I won't feel that tension or that pressure anymore. We think that compromising relieves that pressure. But listen, compromise never ends the tension. It only weakens our resolve. Let me repeat that to you this morning because it's important you catch on to this. We think that compromising is going to take us out of the trouble or the tension. But when we compromise, do you know all we do? We kick the can down the road because eventually we're going to bump up against our conscience again, but now we're just going to be further down the road of disobedience. Let me show you, for example, how this would have worked with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had told themselves, you know what? we're going to just bow our bodies but not our hearts. Or we're just going to do a a quick little bow. You know, as soon as the zither will hardly be warmed up and the music will start, we'll just do a quick bow and we'll just get back up. Or, or, you know, we'll just kind of hide over in the corner where no one sees and we'll just kind of semi-sort of bow or we'll duck a little bit, you know, and we'll just compromise. That'll take all the tension off. You know what? Who knows what's coming next? Next, the king may begin to say, you know what, once a week, Once a week, everybody's got to go to their local place of worship and bow down at the statue I'm going to set up in all the local places. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went ahead to say, hey, what do we got to do? We got to do this once a week now? Maybe the king would have eventually said, you know what? We're going to set up little statues in every one of your homes, and you have to burn incense to me every day, and we're going to come check on you and make sure you're doing it every day. And eventually, again and again and again, you keep bumping up against your conscience because when you compromise, you don't take the pressure off in your life. You simply lose your resolve. You simply end up further down the road of disobedience and destruction. For example... Teens, maybe you say, I know I shouldn't go to that party. 
I know things that honor God won't be going on there, but you say, you know what? I, you know what I'm just going to do? I'm just going to cut my eyes. I'm going to go to the party, but I'm not going to act like anybody else does. So I'm just going to go to the party. So you think they'll take the pressure off because I'll be there and everybody won't notice that I, you know, missed out or whatever. So you go to the party and then you're at the party and you start looking around and the way everybody else is behaving and the way they're dressing and the way they're acting and the things they're laughing at and all of that stuff. And suddenly you're, before you know it, you're like, well, if I stand out and be that different from everybody else, then they're still going to notice. So the pressure's back on again. So now you begin to talk like they talk and laugh like they laugh. Before you know it, now they're drinking at the party. And you know you shouldn't. You know it's against the law. You know it's not the direction you even want your life to go. But they're doing it, so you say, you know what? I guess I'll compromise. I'll just drink. That will be it. And now they're hooking up. And it just keeps going on and on and on. Because when we compromise, we don't resolve anything. We simply lose our resolve. Husbands and wives, we say, you know what God's word says to us, doesn't matter how the world defines marriage, we know that we are to be faithful to each other. And we set up in our lives high walls to safeguard our marriage. In fact, we do things as, as Christian husbands and wives, we set up in our lives protections and guards that go beyond what the world even understands, beyond what they would applaud. And in fact, if they knew what a lot of them were, they would just mock us and call us old-fashioned. What happens if we're tempted to begin to compromise those things? Men, we walk along there in the, at work, and suddenly th there she is, and, and we feel this attraction to this other lady, and we say, you know what? I shouldn't stop and linger at her desk because that's a wall, but don't what? You say, oh, it's really it's no big deal, and you compromise that, and you stop, and you linger, and you chat, and you laugh for a minute, and you walk on, and you might say, oh, so what? You know, so, so I lingered. The world didn't come to an end, but you've begun to compromise. And next, before you know it, it's, it's lunch, and she's sitting there in the break room, and before you know it, you're sitting there next to her, and you're talking. It's just lunch. There's other people sitting here talking, and then before you know it, you've got her number, and now you're texting. It's just texting, right? And over time, before you know it, you're far enough out of town, no one can know it, and you meet, and you're eating dinner together. And I really shouldn't, and I really shouldn't, and I really shouldn't, but you keep doing it, and before you know it, now you're at her house, and I really shouldn't go inside, and now you're inside, and I really shouldn't go upstairs. You see, we don't resolve anything by compromising. We simply lose our resolve, and we go into destruction. And we need to be a people who say, you know what? We're not going to live lives of compromise. We're going to draw a line in the sand here and say, you know what? I can't go along with that. And that's what those three guys did. They said, you know what? We can't do this. We can't go there. That's a bridge too far. And God's followers have been doing that for years and years and years. And still today, we are called to be a people who say, you know what? I will not compromise. You say, the problem with that, Pastor Todd, is it puts us in scary situations. If we take a stand, it's going to make us unpopular. If we take a stand, it's going to make someone think we're weird or an oddball. We're going to get called names. We're going to lose opportunities. But I want you to know today, courage does not mean that you're never afraid. Courage is the willingness to endure that which is fearful, believing God for a good outcome. Or you might say it this way, courage is not a lack of fear, Courage is the willingness to endure something fearful. That's what they did. And that's what we are being called upon to do in an intolerant world. So let me show you a couple things about real courage. The first one is this. You need to recognize it's going to require courage because serving God is an offense. Say that with me. Serving God is an offense. Here's what happened. These guys say, they pay no attention to your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods, and they do not worship the gold statue you have set up. You know, it's very interesting. There was a variety of motivations behind these astrologers coming there. The first one is there's obviously a long-term anger. Because look on the screen there. You see where it says, they refuse to serve your gods. That's an ongoing issue. It's an ongoing issue. They've refused to serve your gods. And now on top of that, you've set up this statue and they won't bow down to it. Listen to me, church. 
it's not possible to have the courage to stand up against the rising tide of evil and remain unnoticed for long. You will be noticed. People are going to see it. You're going to stand out. Now, we don't stick out for the purpose of sticking out. It's very important to understand. We don't say, you know what? Serving God is an offense, so we're offending for the purpose of being offensive. No. We simply will stand out, and that will be in and of itself an offense. And here's why we're going to end up standing out and it's going to get noticed. Because we live in a world that's filled with what we call moral relativism. What it means is what's right for someone today in that particular situation may simply not be right tomorrow, but who can say ultimately that there's right and wrong? And Christians look at people and say, you know what? God wrote down his words, and the Spirit lives in them, and he guides our heart on a daily basis through them, and we can still say that there is a north star of truth, and we can still point our compass and say, right is still right, and wrong is still wrong, no matter what anybody else says, and I can live my life by truth. And so people are going to notice. We're going to end up crossways with them when we do. And so we say, this is the source of my belief. This is the source of truth. And this is the point at which people will call you intolerant. Now, I want you to listen very carefully because we've got to walk through something that is very important for you to understand in the next three or four minutes of this sermon. And the first thing I want to say to you about this whole intolerance thing is this. In reality, genuine Christ followers living in a way Christ has called them to live are actually the most tolerant people on the planet. Genuine Christ followers living as Christ has called us to live are actually the most tolerant people on the planet. Now, you say, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. Christ has called us to realize that when we understand that he has created all people, we must separate the two ideas of the value of a person from the validity of their opinion. We must be able to separate the value of a person from the validity of their opinion. In other words, very precious people sometimes believe very wrong things. If you got it so far, start to nod out if you're starting to track with me. In other words, the person in life that believes the most offensive, most vile, most blasphemous thing that you can think of, the person in life who makes things most difficult for you, here's one thing I want you to know about that person. They are precious to God. God put an eternal spirit inside of them. And remember when we were singing this song today? He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. I want you to know the truth of that song exceeds the walls of this room. And you could gather any person on this planet and sit them down and look at them and say, I want to sing a song to you. God loves you. Understand that? And so as we deal with people, who are living their lives differently than us and have opinions very different than us. The height of tolerance is the reality that we will always love them and treat them with graciousness and kindness and compassion in how we interact with them because they are the children of God, created by Him. And so we then strike this balance that we cannot simply say, oh, whatever I do, I don't want to offend anyone. If your primary objective is to say, I never want anything that I say or do or believe to offend someone, the result will be compromise because look at the big words, serving God, what? Is an offense. You need to understand that the claims that Jesus Christ made that he alone is the way to the Father is itself offensive. And that the world watches our lives, and if you say, you know what, I'm a Christian, and I believe that you need to be a follower of Jesus, and you need to come to understand God's love for you, and that is the way to eternal life, that is offensive in and of ourselves. It has enough offense. But here's the thing you need to understand. In addition to that, we don't need to add additional ad hoc offense on top of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
In other words, we don't have to go out and say, all right, now that I'm saying this is the truth and it's an offense in and of ourselves, let me find a really offensive, annoying, obnoxious way to beat you over the head with it. Let me find a mean-spirited way to try to tell you a God-spirited truth. Rather, we must be a people who do not shove it in someone's face. Look, look, look how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did this. What they didn't do was they didn't say, all right, guys, here comes the moment. Let's jump up and down. Let's get everybody's attention. And let's just, you know, I tell you what, guys, instead of just not bowing, let's find big boxes. I hope I can do this without killing myself today. Let's find big boxes and let's stand on top of them. So when everybody else bows down, we'll stand on top of the box and go, losers, why are you bowing? What kind of idiot you? Woo, we're not doing it. You know, they didn't do it that way. I can safely dismount they didn't do it that way. You know what they did? They just quietly stood. They didn't compromise. But they also didn't go to the king in advance and say, hey, king, we just want to make a big deal with you. We want to tell you what a loser you are. What are you doing building a big stupid old statue like that? No. They just said, you know what? There's the bridge too far. We're not bowing down to that idol. They're noticed. They're noticed, but they don't add offense to it. You see, we don't have to turn everything into a federal case that goes on in our lives. Maybe there's a way to quietly go to that teacher and say, you know what, my child isn't going to read that questionable book. They're not going to write that paper because that, that assignment is inappropriate for our faith, and so... Maybe we could work together to find an alternate assignment that we can do. But you, you don't, you don't got to go in and storm the castle and pin a petition on every locker and, you know, spray paint signs and march because one teacher created an assignment you didn't like. Go talk to them. Go say, we can figure out how to do this. Is there a way not to drag the entire Facebook world into your discussion with the dance instructor about the modesty that needs to take place on your daughter if she's going to dance on their team or the moves that need to be appropriate or the songs that they're going to choose? Is there a way to do that without saying you're a horrible person? Is there a way to communicate with the coach, your support for the team, and to say, you know what, man, you're not going to find anybody more behind you. We're going to have our kids here to practice on time or early, and, and man, we'll, we'll, we'll go and do the baked goods thing, and we'll, we'll get in the stand and help, help sell the stuff, but you've got to understand we're a family that worships, and we're going to find a way to worship on a weekend because that's part of who we are, and so let's figure out how we're going to work this out when we get these intense schedules going on because worship matters, and it'll be prioritized in our lives? Is it possible out there in social media world when you're posting that you can hold your moral position without using slanderous or intentionally hurtful words for those who are so different than you? It's quiet in here this morning, folks, but these are the important things about how we live day by day by day with courage as people who do not compromise and can take a stand. And we know that serving God is an offense, but here's the, the balance we've got to find. This is the paradox we have to embrace. Sometimes I must offend without being offensive. And I know I'm preaching something to you today that requires a lot of thought and a lot of prayer and a lot of gun-wrenching decisions. How are we going to go about this? But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we can stand and hold our ground and say, we will not do this without having to make a bigger case of it than it is, and we'll see what God does from there. Here's the second one. Courage in an intolerant world. We will know that serving God is our defense. Say that with me. Serving God is our defense. I love this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He'll rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. All right, if you're tracking with the story, the pressure just doubled on these guys. First, all the instruments blew. They didn't bow. 
And now the, the, the jealous astrologers bring them to the king. The king is furious. Over in the corner, these guys over here, they're like, man, we better heat up the furnace. They got the billows going, you know. And, and the, these boys are saying they could feel the heat generating from the furnace. And that's where they're headed. And underneath this kind of pressure, this is what these guys say. You know what? We've got a hunch. We've got a hunch, King Nebuchadnezzar, that God's going to rescue us from the furnace. But isn't this interesting? These guys admit they don't have a signed contract from God that says that. They don't have an advanced dream or completely airtight info that they're not going into the furnace or that if they do, they'll be okay when they do. They don't. You know what they say? We got a hunch. God's going to figure out how to pull this off and rescue us. But here's what you need to know, king. Even if he doesn't, even if we go to the furnace, get this, this is worth coming today. Even if we go to the furnace, if the end of the story is we die in the furnace, that is a better end of the story than living in compromise. Because God is our defense. You see, being courageous doesn't guarantee your outcome, but it does guarantee the direction of your life. We find it odd. In fact, some of us have to really stretch our minds and are probably questioning right now my statement that I believe additional persecution is coming our way and that we'll have to endure continued and growing hardship as Christians in this nation because we have enjoyed a favored status for a long time. In fact, for a long time, there's really been kind of this Americana thing that what it was to be an American and what it was to be a Christian were simply commingled and, and intertwined. And not everything about the fact that those two things are becoming separated out is bad, but that's a longer conversation. Because sometimes it's time for the church to realize, you know what, God has always called us to be different and to be set apart. In fact, you need to hear this morning, while we might think it's strange or odd or we actually need the preacher to preach to us about courage, can I tell you something? The first century Christians, those who came right behind Jesus, they fully expected hardship. They expected persecution. They remembered very well. It rang in their ears the words of Jesus who said, guys, understand this. They hate me. They're going to hate you. And some of us today think to ourselves, why would anybody hate a real lifer? We love people. We invite them here because we want good things to happen in their lives. Man, we go out and we talk about how can we serve and what can we do. And, and you know, we, we want to be kind. I mean, we're the best people in the community, right? That's what we think. All right, well, how could anybody hate us? First century Christians knew this. Courage was to be expected and necessary if you were to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Some of the values that you are going to hold dear and some of the lines in the sand that you are going to draw in your life, someone's going to call you a bigot. Someone's going to call you a hypocrite. Someone's going to claim all kinds of things about you. But here's reality. You need to understand to live for Jesus Christ, courage should be expected and it is necessary in our lives. So we can stop looking back at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and simply saying to ourselves, well, those guys had to have courage. God bless them. And say, okay, God, make me a man, make me a woman, make me a teenager who lives with the kind of courage to stand for you in our world. Because at some point, this is what these three determined. Already catch this. We don't know if we will impact the world by coming out of the furnace, but we will impact the world by going in. We're willing for whatever the outcome is to say, you know what? This is obedience to God, and it means into the furnace we go. You know, our God chooses to act in circumstances however he sees best. Sometimes, just before we might go in the furnace, he bails us out, and we don't have to go into the furnace. And sometimes, he meets us right in the middle of the furnace and takes care of us. And sometimes, we burn up. Because I need to say to you, 
And when we think about the idea that there might be persecution coming our way or we might have to take a stand, a courageous stand for God, and we're like, oh, yeah, like the first century Christians. No, not just like the first century Christians, like your brothers and sisters in places around the world today who draw a line in the sand and then go into the furnace for it and are willing to give their lives. This is the lesson of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you're saying, wait, Pastor, that sounded like a closing sentence. Are you wrapping up? Because you haven't told us the end of the story. You You didn't even have someone read the end of the story. And let me tell you, if you're here today and this story is new to you and you don't know how it ends, I am so happy that you're here and I am so jealous of you that you don't know the end because it's so cool the first time you see a movie. It's so cool the first time you read a book, right? so cool the first time you discover it. And you need to go home and read the amazing ending to the story. Are they saved? Are they rescued? Do they die? What happens next? You know, what in the world goes on? You know, if you want to know, Go read the story. But in a sense, it really doesn't matter. And you're like, I'm going to put that on the list of stupid things pastors say. (laughs) You're like, I bet it mattered to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What do you mean it really doesn't matter? Can, Can we... Can we reach that far in our thinking today? I I guess to to explain what I mean, I'd have to explain it with an illustration. My my son, Clay, recently uh, got us into a show. We don't watch a ton of TV, but he got us into The Flash, which is this superhero show. You're really surprised that my son would get us into superhero shows, I'm sure, but but, uh, it's really quite an innocent show, and the guy, the, the, the hero's this young kid, you know, he's in way over his head, and he gets this, you know, lightning hits him, he gets this superpower, he can run really fast, and so we started watching The Flash, and, and, and I think season one of The Flash is already completed, and they're, you know, season two is already slated, it's probably coming out in the fall or something, so what we're doing is, we're DVRing, they're repeating all the episodes one a week, and then we pick a time, and we sit down, and in 38 minutes, you get to watch an hour show and skip the commercials. That's the beauty of DVR. And so we're, we're all into the flash, and we're watching it, right? So we're in, like, episode five or six of season one. And so the other night, we're watching the flash, and we're all together watching it because we've all gotten in together. And, I mean, it's that crucial point about two-thirds of the way into the show where the bad guy is, is too big, and he's too strong, and, and he's too awesome, and, and there's no way the flash can pull this off. And, you know, the flash is there with the other people that are part of his team, and, and the flash like, i got to go deal with this guy. And they're like, no, don't go by yourself. You know, wait for us. we got to do this. And the, and the flash like, no, i got to go. And, you know, he takes off. And you know, it's that moment where you're always like, no, don't go. You can't do it. And you're all worried, is he going to be okay? Is it going to work out? And I look over, you know, and Ken does and Carissa, they're all, they're all into it. And, you know, Clay's all watching. This is cool. I look over to the right, and I know it's, when it's stressful, my wife, she eats hot tamales really fast. When it's high stress, she's over there putting down the hot tamales. And, you know, and I'm sitting there, and I'm on the edge of my seat. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, you know, what's going to happen to poor Flash? And all of a sudden, it hit me. There's a season two. (laughs) And I'm pretty sure that season two is still called The Flash. And so suddenly, this calm comes over me. I just know it's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out. But one way or another, it's going to work out. I can sit back on the couch and kick my feet up. Go, let's see how it's going to work out. Because I know it's going to work out because I know there's another season. See, I want you to know something. If you'll have courage to serve God, at some point you may go into the fire. I don't know how that's all going to, I don't know what friendships will be strained. I don't know what you might lose in this life. I don't know that the day may come that God will call you to go somewhere or do something and lay down your very life. I don't know. But this I know. There's another season. 
And it's a longer season than this life. And there's a day we will stand before God and he will look at us and say, you know what? You had the courage to live for me in a dying world. Come on in and welcome to the next season. And it's an eternal season in the presence of our God because he is our defense and he is sure and steady and he is the solid rock that we can stand on. He is a cornerstone on which we build our lives. Lives. And this is what's ahead of us. Let's just bow our heads together this morning as we close.